They say power corrupts, but in this case, it just drains your battery faster. What's up everybody, I'm Jason, and welcome to my new series where I'll be digging into the ins and outs of the EOS R5C. Yep, you heard me right, that's the cinema op photography optimized version of the venerable EOS R5. Now of course, the big difference between the R5 and the R5C is video mode. And unlike the R5, which uses Canon's Photo OS for everything, the R5C uses Canon's Cinema EOS OS when in video mode, and that's what I'll be focusing on in this series. However, in this first video, I want to look at power consumption on the R5C, and we'll be starting with some idle power consumption tests, then we'll be looking at a few more load tests than what Canon has published in the manual, and finally, we'll take a look at how the R5C compares to the competition on the market. Okay, so with all that said, caveat time. First off, Power consumption and recorded time or record times are complicated. There are a lot of things that the camera that draw power and use different amounts of power at that. Different lenses will make a difference. Is IS enabled? Autofocus? That will all make a difference. What compression algorithm are you using on the camera? So RAW, HEVC, uh, AVC, whatever. That makes a difference. Even whether you're using the EVF or the viewfinder can make a difference to the record time to one extent or another, or power consumption. Second, my best way to measure power consumption currently is using USB power delivery and a USB-C multimeter. Now that said, my solution has some limitations. However, and doing some validation tests, one of which I'll talk about later in this video, the results that I'm seeing are pretty close to the numbers that Canon has published for the R5C. So while these numbers are not 100% accurate, they are close enough to be useful for making estimations on how much power you can expect the camera to draw. So with the caveats out of the way, what's up with power consumption and the R5C? Well, the short of it is that in video mode, the camera draws considerably more power as there's considerably more load on the system than there is for either the R5 when shooting video or the R5C in photo mode. And ultimately, this is due to the Cinema EOS operating system and the aims and design decisions that were made to support a professional video or cinematography application. So to start with, the R5C always downsamples from the sensor's native res or the native resolution of the crop factor that you've selected to the recording resolution that you've selected. So if you're shooting full frame, it's always 8K getting downsampled. Now the only time that this isn't done, at least to my understanding and my testing so far, is when you're shooting at 120 frames per second, in which case then it does use line skipping. Now, if you compare this to the R5, which only uses the sensor's native resolution when set to either 8K, 4K high quality, or when you're in APS-C crop mode, then it does actually downsample. Otherwise, when shooting in full frame mode, it line skips for everything to reduce the load on the camera's power draw. Now, why does this matter? Well, put simply, because dealing with 35 million pixels worth of data and downsampling that for every frame, 30 plus frames a second, or even 60 frames a second, requires a lot more power than dealing with a whole lot fewer pixels. Now, moreover, the R5C does this all the time, not just when you've hit the record button and the camera is recording. The Cine EOS OS d doesn't make any assumptions that the only way that the camera is being used to record is when it's being recorded to the card using the camera's record function. The camera could just as easily be used in a broadcast or studio situation where it's being used to stream high quality footage over HDMI there is no SDI port on the R5C, but the other cinema cameras do have SDI, to an external recorder or a video village or a, a video truck or something like that for broadcast. And obviously in those cases, you don't want the camera to be producing a lower quality file than what it would be producing if you were recording to the card. Now, conversely, by default, the R5 uses low resolution uh, or low resolution mode when idling and only steps up to the proper or full resolution when the camera is recording, or if you've disabled the standby low quality setting, which is enabled by default. So 
Generally, the R5 aims to save as much power when it's not actually recording video as possible, where the R5C aims to provide the highest quality video possible, batteries be, well, drained. Now, because of this, I wanted to start this te my tests off by looking at idle power consumption. Now, for these tests, and in fact, all of these tests, I let the camera run for five minutes while being powered through USB and my USB multimeter. That logs the power consumption in watt hours. I could then convert the watt hour measurement and the time to watts to determine the average power consumption of the camera. You can't just read instantaneous watts because it fluctuates. Now for these tests, I had a Canon EF 16 to 35 millimeter F4L IS lens or IS USM lens mounted to the control ring mount adapter on the camera. Image stabilization was disabled, and the autofocus switch or autofocus was turned off in software on the camera, but the lens's autofocus manual focus switch was left in the autofocus position. Now, finally, for these idle tests, the camera was set to 23.976 frames per second, which is what I usually shoot at, so it seemed like a good place for me to start, at least with idle power. Now, with the R5C idling in full frame mode, I saw an average power consumption of 8.5 watts. Stepping it down to Super 35 mode dropped the power usage to 7.3 watts, and finally dropping to Super 16 crop mode dropped the power consumption to just 5 watts. Now, I had gotten a question in my first impressions video on the R5C as to whether power the power consumption increase was limited to video mode on the R5C or if it applied across the board to photo mode as well. So I flipped the R5C into photo mode and repeated the test, and here I saw an idle power consumption of about 3 watts. Now, for reference, this is the same as what I've measured on my R5 running firmware 1.5.2. So, idle power consumption on the R5C in photo mode appears to be identical to that of the R5, which makes sense. However, in video mode, the R5C definitely draws a lot more power. So, what about record times? How does this translate to that? Well, this is where things get even more complicated, and part of that goes back to the aforementioned considerations of things that draw power in the camera, but also because there are several different compression options for recording as well. Now, Canon has done us a real handy favor and published a table of, of the most power-intensive record settings on page 238 in the manual. However, as I said, this covers only the most power-intensive operations, not necessarily all of the operations, and not even necessarily all of the operations that many people might shoot in, such as 24 frame per second mode. So, for my own uses, I wanted to look at three formats that Canon didn't cover specifically, and those were 4K 30 frame per second, 2K 60 frame per second, and 2K 30 frame per second. Now, all of these would be done when shooting with the full frame sensor area, because that's what I want to be shooting at most of the time, and using HEVC compression, because that's the compression I'm looking at using probably most of the time. Now, for these tests, I used the same methodology that I used in the idle power tests. Ran the camera for five minutes, recorded the power consumed from my multimeter, made the conversion, etc. Additionally, I used the same lens, same lens and set camera settings, except in this case, the frame rates and the, the, that was being used and that the camera was recorded in, recording and not just idling. So to start off, I wanted to see how my USB power delivery tests compared to Canon's own measurements. I figure they, they're probably not measuring USB power delivery, so but who knows. So I ran my first test at 4K resolution and 60 frames per second. Now, admittedly, I messed up a little bit here. In my haste to test this, and I didn't pull up the manual, and I didn't look up what configuration Canon used. So my test isn't quite the same as the tests Canon performed. Specifically, I shot an ultra high def 4K, not DCI 4K. I used 420 chroma subsampling and not 422, and I recorded to an SD card instead of a CF Express card. Some of these are relevant stuff for me, or relevant differences for me, but they do kind of or can could potentially skew the numbers. Now that said, I measured an average of 14 watts in my 4K60 test, and this is slightly lower than the 14 and a half watts that Canon publishes. However, as I said, my test numbers are not 
quite 100% accurate, and that half watt difference is well within the uncertainty of my own measurements as well as the slight differences in configuration. Dropping the camera down to 4K 30 frames per second saw the power consumption drop to 9.8 watts. Now repeating the same set of tests at 1080p, so 1080p 60 and 1080p 30, saw power consumptions of 13.5 watts and 9.4 watts for the 60 and 30 frame per second modes respectively. So let's talk a little bit about these numbers. First, frame rate is a, if not the, major factor when it comes to power consumption. And that's even over potentially or frame size. Lowering the frame rate drops the power consumption far more than lowering the output resolution, like way far more than that, or even lowering the crop factor. So in short, if you want to save battery power and you don't need to shoot at 60 frames a second, don't shoot at 60 frames a second. Secondly, we can see the impact of down sampling in power usage. There is a meager four or half watt difference between 4K60 and 2K60 tests, and a similar 0.4 watt difference between the two resolutions at 30 frames a set per second. The difference between output resolution are almost immaterial in terms of power consumption, something that's only going to be the case if the camera is in fact reading out and processing the full sensor area and not line skipping. Now I wanted to put the line skipping situation into some perspective here, so to show how much power saving comes with line skipping, I repeated the 4K60 test, only this time using my R5, the standard one, which does use line skipping when shooting 4K60 if you're not in high quality mode. Now the power usage in that test was a mere 7 watts, just half of what we see on the R5C at the same frame rate and resolution. And that is the savings that you get with line skipping. So the R5, is the R5C really bad at this in, compared to the industry or, well, how does this all compare? Now, unfortunately, it's very hard to put definit a definitive answer to this, uh, at least for me and at least without doing a lot more testing on cameras that I don't actually own. So if I compare the R5C to the C500 Mark II, the R5C is about twice as efficient as the C500. Canon rates the C500 is getting about 125 minutes when shooting 4K60 XF-AVC at 810 megabits on the camera's 90 watt hour BP-A60 battery. Now that translates to a power draw of somewhere around 43 watts. Now if we compare that to the R5C, which draws 14.8 watts at the same output resolution using the full frame sensor, etc. So pretty good. Alternatively, we could look at Blackmagic Design's Pocket Cinema Camera 6K. These are rated as getting 60 minutes of 6K24 recording raw on an NPF F or an NPF 570 battery. And that translates to a 26 watt load. The battery is 26 watt hours, 60 minutes is an hour. Pretty easy math there. So at 8K30 raw, which is pretty comparable and I don't have to do tests to get numbers, the R5C pulls in a meager 11.7 watts, so it's twice as efficient as the uh, pocket cinema camera. Now as for other compact mirrorless cameras, things become a lot less clear. The only really comparable cameras on the market are Nikon's Z9 and Sony's Alpha 1, and neither of these companies have published really good details on their power consumption. They're kind of doing the same consumer camera battery runtime inf uh, information dump that, well, even Canon does for their consumer cameras, so not detailed charts of resolutions and so forth. For the Nikon Z9, or for the Z9, Nikon simply states that the camera can record for 170 minutes. However, they don't provide any details on the setup, resolution, etc. Now, given that the Z9 uses a 35.6 watt hour battery, that translates to 12.6 or a 12.6 watt load, which puts the Z9 and R5C on roughly the same footing. Now, the Z9 does downsample for its lower resolution, so it should have a comparable power profile to the R5C in terms of not sh you know, shooting at 8K or 4K or 1080p. As for Sony, 
Their published continuous record number is designed to give them the biggest possible number that they possibly can have in their marketing. They use line skipped 1080p 60 video and the results from that come out at something like 6.4 watts. However, as we saw earlier with the R5's line skipped 4K versus the R5C's downsampled 4K video, line skipping saves a tremendous amount of power although that comes at the cost of image quality. So it's really hard to gauge how the R5C compares to the Alpha One as the R5C doesn't actually have a low res line skipped mode to provide sort of comparable numbers. Now all that said, the short of it is that the R5C doesn't actually appear to be behind the curve in terms of power efficiency. However, the problem from both an optics perspective and a practical one is the combination of the camera always downsampling, which does give it the best image quality possible, never having an idle mode, which other cameras do when they're not recording, and the small by cinema and video camera standards battery, or even by the Nikon Z9's battery standard, that the R5C actually uses. Now, of course, the immediate and probably best solution to this problem is to do what the cinema and video professionals are already doing for their big cinema cameras, and that's to use external power in one shape or another. However, digging into externally powering your R5C is a topic that I will get into in another video. So, if you found this video useful, or at least interesting, let me know by hitting that like button. If this kind of thing seems like it might be your kind of thing, hit that subscribe button too if you haven't already. Finally, if you know someone who might find this useful, help them and me and share it with them. As always, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.